My guest today is John Miller. This is uh, part two of our conversation. Um, John and I um, talked last week about his work and we're going to continue that today. John is a documentary photographer based in Irisburg, Vermont. His career has spanned a wide range of projects in the in, on life in the Northeastern Vermont what we call the Northeast Kingdom, Italy, the West, well, anywhere he travels. Today we will be talking about, we will be continuing our conversation about the evolution of his career as an artist and his deep love for humanity. Welcome, John. Thank you. So let me just recap for our audience sort of what we talked about last week. And I'm just going to do the big the big overview. <laughs> so we'd start in our conversation talking about your childhood in a small rural community in Vermont with parents who weren't from Vermont, but had moved there from an urban area. And and then you went to high school at a private boys boarding school, which was quite a contrast in a social experience on to college where you began your studies in geology. I think that ref reflected in your work, but then developed a love for photography. Your first position uh, out, out on graduation was as a staff photographer for the Shelburne Museum. Now uh, the Shelburne Museum in Burlington, Vermont, well, it's in Shelburne, Vermont, but in Chittenden County in the Northwest corner of Vermont, Shelburne Museum um, is a, a, a unique museum. We talked about that in the show, but it's it was funded by um, was funded by a, a member of the Vanderbilt family, and once and and who collected not only fine art, impressionist art, but also um, everyday folk items. She was really the beginning um, um, collector of folk art in the United States. Is that correct? It was very early. Um, yeah, very early. And tell me her name. It was her. Her. her what, was, what was her first name? Uh, Electra. Electra Webb. Right. Electra Havemeyer Webb. Right. So, um, but John, at the same time, was traveling back to his the where his family, his mother lived in this small rural community in Vermont often looking at the same objects that that farmers were and, and workmen were still using that were now uh, museum uh, uh, items collected as museum items so at any rate this was a unique experience and it's part of the theme that we'll continue talking about of this contrast between you know a very kind of rural simple life and the you know sort of more privileged and um uh sort of artistic communities that you've traveled between um so when we stopped the interview we were talking about your um your then experiences in graduate school in rochester new york um so can you start by just explaining to the audience what that graduate school was that what the program was and um what you how your what your focus of your work was there uh, sure. I, I, again, I, as I mentioned uh, last week, I had worked at Shelburne Museum for about five years, um, photographing objects primarily, and that's really what I continued to do later in my life as a freelancer. I was, I was known in the business, uh, particularly the museum world, as an object photographer. So that's what I became, you know, very adept at, the very, very technical kinds of work from both the the lighting and the processing and the printing, because again, this all these objects I was photographing were often going into publications internationally. And um, so the, the requirement for very high um, to delineate all the subtleties of whatever objects I would be photographing. And they were everything from, it might be you know, a wonderful 18th century marble to, um, you know, large quilts to extraordinary pieces of American furniture. Uh, so the, the, the sizes of the objects ranged immensely. But there came a point where I, you know, 
and, and meeting a, a friend through some of the exhibiting work that I was doing with that, those photographs that I was making in Northeastern Vermont. Um, as I mentioned, one very close, we came a close colleague to review my work. And then later, oh, maybe a year or so later, suggested I maybe consider going out to take a workshop in Rochester, studying with this sort of a guru in photography, whose name is Nathan Lyons. Um, but if I wasn't going to go out there to at least read about him, so I went right out and bought one of Nathan's books and looked at his work. It was very intriguing to me. It was very much about visual communication for there were no words in his book. Mm -hmm. Um, all they were was images, really, but he created sort of sequences of images that sort of subliminally or intuitively sort of told stories, some form of narrative, but it was entirely visual, something with which I certainly didn't understand in, in any academic way, but it was, I could sort of appreciate it from a sort of a visual point of view. Anyway, I went out there with a portfolio and uh, met Nathan and, and talked with him, spent a night, you know, toured this place called the Visual Studies Workshop which he um, basically began uh, after he had been a curator for quite a number of years at the George Eastman House of Photography. And uh, I was so impressed by my experience with him and just seeing the operation. I made a decision. I came back home and decided I'd resign and go to graduate school. So that was understandably a, a huge move. I was married with a young child at that point, my daughter, and um, I actually went ahead to Rochester for a semester in, in the undergraduate program and um, just did photography there, just shooting uh, for an advanced photography class, working with a fellow from uh, Toronto who would come down during the week for, I think, two days a week. He, he, he came down to the workshop to Rochester. Very interesting fellow, Dave Heath, um, also quite a renowned photographer. I, um, after that first semester, I went. I applied to the graduate school program and you know entered the, that fall. It was interesting school, as, as I mentioned last week. Um, the majority of the people they were extremely visual, um, and one particularly interesting anecdote was. Um, majority of the uh, students there, uh, grads and undergrads were all left-handed, which I didn't know exactly what that meant. I'm not sure um, if that was some form of key to their visual success, but um, it was a interesting place where there, there was immense amounts of competition in a way. There were uh, contemporary newspapers like After Image was published there, which is sort of a, uh, sort of a new media uh, magazine newspaper that was quite had great distribution around the United States. Um, they trained people to be curators of photography. They had video labs. They had darkroom laboratories. Um, they had were not really using digital at that point, so that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, but film film was, uh, of course, the primary photographic medium there, um, or the only photographic medium. They also had a wonderful research center an archive, a uh, very large library. It's a, a large portion initially of the collection was with Nathan Lyon's private photographic and graphic, graphic uh, book collection. Um, they had uh, a bookstore that carried contemporary artist books, which I thought was particularly fascinating. They had a gallery with, that, that handled um, and sold art by contemporary photographers from around the US. They also, um, Again, had an archive, a very large collection of actually of prints um, that were was always required when you graduated from the workshop. You were to leave a selection of your work. So uh, over the many years, I had amassed quite a collection of contemporary artists' work. Um, in the gallery, let's see what else. Oh, they just had a printing press. Um, we eventually developed, moved into a, a larger complex as a part of the earlier Eastman School buildings, which had been vacated by the. Eastman School of Music. And we had a uh, printing facility, which was operated by Nathan Lyon's wife, Joan, who is actually a very renowned printmaker and uh, photographer. And they published and printed the books working uh, with artists. So it, it was a really, it was a busy center of, of uh, all kinds of 
publishing and art making. Um, and so I, we have to identify some form of um, graduate plan, graduate program plan in terms of, of what you're going to be doing for thesis work. So as I'm doing these advanced photographic courses and this um, and seminars with different historians and things, I had to make the decision what I'd be doing. So I said I would, I would do a photographic um, element of my as part of my final thesis. But I somehow I don't remember what it, how I came upon this, but I had done been on a research project with another interesting uh, historian who was a visiting professor there for one or two years named Michael Lessey. He later went on for a number of years to Hampshire College in Massachusetts, but um, he, was, he had just, prior to his coming to the workshop, had published his book, um, uh, 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 Wisconsin Death Trip, working with a large photographic collection in, uh, at the Wisconsin Historical Society. And he used photographs uh, as an alternative way with which to write history, if you can imagine. Uh, he was not entirely accepted by the traditional historical community where they used words and they occasionally used photographs to augment their writing as mere illustrations, whereas Michael Lessig flipped that whole concept and used entirely visual material and would write these very scintillating introductory essays to the work to sort of prepare the reader, the visual reader, as it were. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, th these kinds of things between Nathan Lyons and, and, and Michael Lessey, the, the, the people who were teaching were very visual people also. And so to understand them, the, the, the influence was immense for those of us, well, most of us who were very visual, visually minded already. Um, anyway, I was doing a, one of, a research for one of his projects and, and was working up at the, uh, at the University of Rochester looking at some of their rare books, they had extraordinary rare books in their, a number of library collections. And I think I happened upon the history of medicine collections that they had. Um, it just sort of connected between connection between the library and, and also the the uh, Strong Memorial Hospital, which is a, a very, very large teaching hospital in Rochester. And in their collections, I ran into a fellow who was a librarian, you know, scholar of uh, science, scientific illustration in particular. So he, he brought me right into this archive and just started showing me these extraordinary books. And I, 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 we, we, I stayed there. I, went, I was supposed to be back for dinner. I remember I stayed till about 10 o'clock at night this first time I met him because we just ranted about all these extraordinary books which they had. Again, it was my first introduction to early books. Again, they, they had um, early Renaissance books published in, in Europe, of course, like people like Vesalius, the, the great anatomist. But they had earlier versions of anatomical books and later ones, the Italian uh, illustrators working with engraving. And, and what was interesting is that as, as I was learning about graphic uh, printing techniques and things at the workshop, I was um, being introduced to these extraordinary books, which was showing me also the sort of the history of printing technology from the early woodcut printing of St. Vincent Vesalius books in the very early 1500s into the uh, engravings and etching and lithographers. And they had the first editions of all these books, of, as I mentioned last week, I think Copernicus and Galileo and as I said, Vesalius and, and, and then later anatomists working in Italy and then Germany and England. Um, and, it, and it was interesting it, it, you know, it, to see where the references to the camera were, were first being introduced in some of these illustrated mm -hmm. anatomical texts where they actually had, uh, and even Da Vinci made references to the human eye. And he was one of the first scientists um, He's, I guess he's referred to more as an artist, of course, but but he really was very much a scientist that he was using, using the camera obscure in the late 1400s. Uh, and, and, and he would do illustrations that compared the camera obscura, which we have sort of the contemporary version of that now in cameras, um, with the human eye. Works the same way, you know, inverts the image and the, the retina of the eye, you know, picks up the image and is transferred and, and understood for the use of our brain. but. Um, I became so fascinated with this material that I decided I'd sort of do a double major and produce some form of book 
uh, or publish some form of research on what I was sort of learning with, by looking at these texts. And it was, I took on a huge project besides just being a, a photographer, which I sort of was my initial mission when I went to Rochester, but it ended up being probably the most consuming, but also incredibly rewarding project uh, working with, again, the material, but also the, the curators who were there who mm -hmm. were just passionate about the material. So, now, John, one thing we we have spoken about that this is really, you know, bringing to mind for me was just the passion that you have spoken about. I mean, you speak passionately about your work, but you also talked about the significant how important the passion of your mentors has been to you in the development of your career. That, that's right. And it's, it's interesting. I, I, at, at, at times, I really had to seek them out. Um, but I found it that just naturally, I I've always have, um, with my interest in photography, I mean, I think curiosity has always been a, certainly part of my mm -hmm. foundation in terms of always wanting to learn things. And and just knocking on people's doors. I did it in Northern Vermont when I went out to photograph. I find myself sitting down and having lunch with um, farmers, and 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 they would, they you know, they very proudly told me about what they were doing for work. I sometimes was you know go out into the barns with them and and follow them, photographing, listening. They tell extraordinary stories, and, and again, it, it didn't matter what um, fine kinds of formal education. Uh, was involved. I was. I think I was just basically drawn to these people who just enjoyed what they were doing. And I, and I, I in no way want to romanticize the very hard work <laughs> as as farming um, in the cold seven days a week. But there had to be something besides just uh, making a living to keep people on a farm for their life for entire lifetime of work anyway, and uh, be out bracing the elements and, and work under extreme conditions, extreme, even bodily damage in terms of their work, but they continued to do it and they were very involved with their communities and all that work ethic and um, and the passion of materials, as I said, we, we make the leap from the people in rural Vermont to photographing across rural America, which I've done for numerous weeks, to um, going into archives as a freelance photographer and working with rare book curators, for instance, who would handle these books, or uh, curators of painting, or, or um, fabric design, or I mean, any number of curators of all kinds of um, historical significance. And then um, working with contemporary artists, I photographed the sculpture and painting for contemporary artists, uh, living near Providence, Rhode Island for about 15 years. I, of course, interact with many uh, RISD faculty, and they would have me photograph their work, or they put me on to big projects. Um, I mean, one, I remember one project, a graphic designer named Malcolm Greer, who was uh, direct, uh, chair of the uh, graphic design department at RISD, really interesting fellow. He had a studio, Malcolm Greer Designers, where he would basically grab the cream of the crop of the grad students as they graduated and brought them right into his studio and um, had them working and helping to produce these incredible projects. It could be books, magazines, posters for, I mean, some of his clients for like the Museum of Modern Art, Guggen Guggenheim Museum. And so these young people in their tw late twenties would be working on mm -hmm. these huge projects of, of significance. But he, he, I, he was one of the people with, uh, whom I showed up my portfolio and he took a a number of months, but they called me on a project um, where they were asked to produce some form of uh, site sculptures for a, this large, like about an eight or 10 story high building for the Trinity Repertory Theater, I remember in Providence, Rhode Island. So he had a couple of masks that he picked up in Central America. Have you seen, are you familiar with those little wire mesh masks that people would mm -hmm. wear on uh, maybe Nicaragua or Honduras, and it would be slightly just a, sort of a subtle amount of color on them and they put them, uh, but he he went to a sculpture fabricator down in in uh, north uh, haven connecticut near new haven and 
uh, had him reproduce those masks uh, and produce sculptures, these two masks. Each mass is about 20 feet high and mm -hmm. 14 or 16 feet wide. And, and so he hired me to go down toward uh, North Haven and photograph them in this huge tractor trailer, bring the masks up, and then I had to photograph the, all the riggers and, and cranes erecting these masks on the building, which was quite dangerous because I did a series of photographs on the roof. Uh -huh looking off the edge of the building at the, the fabricators below hanging the mask. But what was interesting about the project is that um, I, you know, I had lunch with the fabricator who invited me down to his studio. And um, that's what he and his, all his workers did is they made these huge uh, sculptures uh, for sculpt doors. Uh, but there's, there's sort of the shadow that they, they, as an architect friend of mine said it, he, the, the people who build the buildings make all the money and they just get a token fee. And it's, it's pretty much the same case, but they, they did work for Oldenburg and, oh, Beverly Pepper. I mean, many, many different mm -hmm. major American sculptors. Um, but so I, I went down there a number of times photographing the sculptures there in the process of making these things. Some of the sculptures are maybe 50 to 75 feet long, maybe 30, 40 feet high or higher actually. And they ended up in Chicago and New York and things. And that, so a lot of that, I, these kinds of jobs, I just would meet somebody and bang, I'd be right into another project, like working with uh -huh. another company who put the, the marble um, outer skins on tall buildings in, all, in cities all over the United States. There, there was an Italian company. And, and so I ended up photographing some of their projects they were working with. Mm -hmm. uh, so your, how, John, as you, as, so I asked you to talk about the passion of your mentors, and then you start to tell us about all, just one, a series of one um, very creative person versus another, and that you somehow had the opportunity to get to know because of the service that you provided to them visually, right? But how would you describe your passion? That's what I'm thinking about as I'm listening well, to you well, my talk passion, about. Well, I guess it's, it's really the process of discovery uh -huh. and it's a, it's a process of observation and, 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 I, you put, I mean, it's interesting how, how can I articulate it? using words um in terms of the process of discovery I've, I've learned a great deal about myself and and things that interest me just through the uh using the camera i mean the camera was a sort of an avenue in for, uh it allowed me into scenarios that i would otherwise not ever enter probably right mm -hmm. um and that and by that i mean um it well, it wasn't an excuse but it was a, a well, or was it a calling card per se, but it, 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 it helped uh, provide structure uh, to who I was, what I did with my life, and, um, and I think, with, you know, quite, admittedly, quite a large amount of work. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. It was not fast track. You, you don't go to the front of the pack or or ascend without being you know you really have to work at it and and, and um what do you mean by work at it work work very hard at it in order to learn the process i mean you can go to school and man, when i went out the visual studies workshop they, they they didn't it wasn't like a photo school where you, know, you learn how to do lighting or you you know all these different exercises learning the discipline is that most of the people who arrived there were already photographers and we were really working on developing and our vision and and pursuing projects right my experience at Shelburne Museum for five years really gave me a great a very strong foundation in the technical is it was really developing my mind and, and ways of thinking and expanding uh the way I uh, with which I approach subject matter uh it wasn't even necessarily how I composed because even that was sort of that was sort of set. That was it seemed like it was very easy for me to compose mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, you might say, "Well, what?" In other words, I have to decide what 
falls within that frame, sort of a gestalt. How do you organize all these complex, diverse elements to have them sort of hold together, right, with just a frame? And it's a, it's a painters work with the same concept. But again, that was that was that was particularly the way I work. I mean, people work outside of the frame, understandably, sculptors and things, um, videographers, filmmakers. Well, filmmakers actually work with the frame too, extensively, but uh, in repetition. But but what uh, again, the camera was a, a way that I think it hooked me and brought me into the subject matter. Um, and once with the subject matter, the process of interacting with just literally being out in the landscape and photographing or photographing architecture or interacting with people. I mean, I, I, again, I had the very good fortune of always, I mean, 99% of the time interact with really interesting people. Now, now, how do, what do you attribute to that? What's, what's really interesting about that is that's my take. I mean, other people would say those people really aren't that interesting at all. They're, they're uh, whatever, you know, they're, it's not, she's nothing but a gardener. Or he's nothing, he's only drives, drives trucks, but then you, be, you realize that everybody has a fascinating story, right? Sure. Everything, I always say that everything yeah. people do, who and up or what you do is legitimate and is interesting, right? And if you don't believe it, get in a truck and drive down and spend a day driving out on the road with somebody, right? Um, and you realize it's, it's everything. Life is very complex. You, we, it's, it's, we like to simplify it, but it's, everything is complex. Right, but the other part of that, I can imagine two people in a car for the day without discovering that. Because it, as you said in the beginning, your curiosity about the other person is what brings out the their complexity and the depth of that of that person. Well, I think it's curiosity, but I think it's the other another thing is the respect for the other person, mm -hmm. right? It's um, and I, I sort of talked about that as a photographer, but it wasn't until I spent a long period of time doing tape recording of people where I put the camera down. And then I had to listen, right? And initially, I, I said it was a squirming a bit. I mean, I didn't want to do it. I wouldn't had to do that somewhat discreetly in order not to be rude. But um, I really had to sit still for long periods of time. And, and you know, I asked questions periodically, but I just had to listen. Um, and I usually had the tape recorder running. Um, that's old fashioned tapes, cassettes, not digital, anything at that point. But, um, I found that it was a whole, it was a, it was a, became a conceptual leap for me um, to go through the process of extensive recording and also listening, um, because that helps me learn about writing. As I was working my first book, Deer Camp, um, I would have never considered myself a writer, but I, I learned that actually, I thought, who might be cheating sort of writing people's stories like you have to come up with the ideas yourself or something which is well actually it's not the, uh -huh. that's not the case at all uh -huh. it's, you know, it's, it, stories are based on stories right um and it uh the process of spending you know vermont folklife center gave me a grant to spend about two months in the field and i just went and it was the same idea as doing my freelance work I was telling you earlier about you know working with the designers and ending up working with fabricators and going from fabricators, finding my way back into the sculptors for whom they were uh, working. But um, the same thing happened with um, tape recording that you know when you finish recording somebody, you ask them and they're, they're talking about people and I say, well, are they still alive? Or, well, you know, they just live down the the road. You should uh -huh. stop down there. Well, now of course. You John, excuse me, but you were doing this tape recording for a project for the uh, this is the, 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 folk life, the Vermont Folklife Center, which is an in, oral, Middlebury. in Middlebury, which takes oral histories, is collecting oral histories. So they have a very large archive of, right. of uh, oral, oral history. And, um, and you were doing this independently of your photographic work? I, I, I was. Uh, yeah. They had given me a grant. This is the, the Deer Camp book was about to be published maybe in about a year. Okay, we're gonna take a break right now. It's that time. 
And when we come back, well, I want, we're going to start with talking about the Deer Camp Project, because that's, you know, very interesting. And I think in many respects, a very representative of you and your work and your passions. This is Mercy Russell with a Remarkable Relationship Show. I'm here today with Matt Miller, a documentary photographer from Northeastern Vermont. We'll be back after the break. Have something important to say? Want to help improve our world? Need to promote your business uniquely and effectively? KKNW is the answer. Our staff helps broadcasters and podcasters create professional sounding audio. Bring your talent and let our experts help you craft a radio show or podcast that best delivers your message. Learn more at 1150kknw.com. That's 1150kknw.com. KKNW, talk variety that's live and local. Make it a great day. Keep your dial on Alternative Talk 1150. Hello, this is Mercy Russell with a Remarkable Relationship Show, and I'm back here with John Miller, a documentary photographer from the northeastern kingdom of Vermont and we're talking about we've been talking about his career as a documentary photographer and we just left off talking about his project a book called Deer Camp uh, we've been talking about it so <laughs> we're going to try to you know pick up the subject um, John can you tell you know explain you know to the audience what that what that project was about and um, uh, how you know how it it was a very it was a really popular book in vermont your your photographic essay and um i'm also curious about how it influenced you doing that project and then the aftermath of it okay well the <laughs> i guess i'll proceed to describing the actual book to um sort of the a working tradition I had was often, uh, no matter where I lived, and I was working at Shelburne Museum, remember I'd go back to Northern Vermont, mm -hmm. I was maybe about a, that would be about an hour and a half ride back to the Northeast Kingdom where I was living, had, had lived. Um, but I think part of that was in fact, just returning to a place which, uh, which was very familiar to me, and also a place which I really enjoyed, a, a location I really enjoyed being. Uh, that part of the world. And no matter where I had lived um, outside of Vermont, I said I was in graduate school in Rochester or later 15 years or so down in Southern Massachusetts. Uh, I always kept one foot in Vermont and would return as, you know, always on a periodic basis. But particularly in the fall, I always felt this draw to go back to Northern mm -hmm. Vermont. Mm -hmm. And I was not raised in hunting, uh, per se, but I had certainly talked to hunters who had, you know, had gone down country, as they said, to find work because it's they, because of either the university training, the, the kinds of jobs they were looking for were not available in more remote Vermont, parts of Vermont anyway. Down country, by the way, is going to southern New England, southern Vermont. Right. That, that, that's that's right. That, that's a that's a vernacularism, right? Um, mm -hmm. But down country could have been actually just about going from uh, one one end of your land to the other if you were <laughs> three or four hundred acres. It didn't have to be a, a trip that involved a, a tractor or a a vehicle, other vehicle. Um, but anyway, um, I was working in um, or living in southern Massachusetts, but uh, working on projects all over. So I'm pretty much uh, southern New England, working with museums and libraries, and I, and I basically have worked, done documentary projects in all the New England states and many of the Mid Atlantic states, on location where I bring my studio and everything. Um, but I was returning, um, and my mother still lived in northern Vermont, so I of course return and visit there with her, stay for and help out with projects and things and. But I, I had this great yearning to go back. I remember 1987, you know, my freelance work at times went seven days a week for weeks and weeks and even months. 
And then times I, I might have two weeks and I just didn't have anything lined up on the calendar. So I just saw that as an opportunity to, to not just rest or anything. I would just head right out and, and do my own photography. The more creative side that, that you paid money to do, you were not paid to do. And so I went up to Vermont, I remember. Uh, it was in mid to late October and I was, I just brought color film with me and I was photographing and just and went into farmhouses, some of, uh, working with some people whom I had worked with maybe, um, oh, eight to 10 years prior to that. Actually more than, you know, say 1882, seven, yeah, about, about 10 years prior. And it, people were still living much older, but I, you know, I came into the tripod and did interiors of their houses and maybe they were sort of closing up their gardens at the end of the fall and before winter and, and, and harvesting everything. So I did, you know, different kinds of color portraits and things. But I remember going to a diner up in Coventry, Vermont, which is not far from where I now live. And I remember these very animated, this was again, late October, um, hunting season, deer season began in the second week of November. And I remember these fellows all sitting along the, the counter at the diner, all talking in the most animated way about deer season. And they were telling all these stories. And I remember walking over and saying, God, what are you guys talking about? And like, I had not really, been involved with deer hunting maybe once or twice with my father but he wasn't a big hunter um again i think with the french families in particular who were major hunters at least the ones i knew in northern vermont um and uh the fellows are telling me about going to their family's hunting camps it's a large french family um but he said you know hunting season deer season is better than christmas I thought that was, I had never heard anything like that. And I thought, wow, that's, this, this, this sounds like something very serious. So I, he elaborated and I, you know, I sat down near him on the, in the, on the um, diner counter and he went on and on about how they, you know, they all have started for like a month in advance going out and scouting deer sign and which is you no know, looking for evidence of bucks in the woods and everything. But planning on the whole family comes in, you know, the parents, the grandparents, the children, their grand grandchildren, the huge affair. Um, and um, everybody's involved in the family uh, with the hunting and producing food, and they end up actually spending Thanksgiving in many of these hunting camps. But it was so interesting to me that I, I took lots of notes and, and went, had to go back down to Southern Massachusetts for a project, but I made a decision that I would come up. I sort of set my schedule, kept my calendar open for the month of November, and, and which was nice about the freelance life. I could do that. In, not always, but in this particular case, it worked. And I, I went went back up for the whole month of November uh, for literally four weeks, stayed at my mother's place, our old family place, and went out in the field and, 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 and made contacts and, and spent an immense amount of time staying at camps and and um photographing day and night i mean i would i would leave often in the morning by 5 to 5 30 in the morning because i had to get out to a hunting camp by say seven o'clock uh, over near the connecticut river which you know was at the very eastern end on the uh, new hampshire border um to make make a portrait maybe of a, a group of hunters outside of their camp um, and then just kept just like my freelance photographic career. You have a lead, you follow it, and you just and it just goes on and on. And of course, once I had a, a few invitations and, and interactions with hunters, I heard these great stories, and then I went on to the next camps and and started to tell stories about some of my experiences. Already. And of course, everybody wanted to hear what I had done, and so they said, "Come back again in a week." We want to hear more stories. So it was it was a really sort of a give and take in experience of my telling stories and also listening to great stories and photographing and sort of learning the technology. It was it was it was challenging because at times it was I was out in a blizzard with my cameras on a tripod. I had lighting issues and I'm photographing you know hunters loading a deer in a, in a snowstorm at night how do i do with the lighting um it was it was it was a, my first year was it was it was wild and also just 
trying to make the context. But, but I, I pursued the project for another um, four years and, and went up in November for the next four years. So it took mm. about five years, but in the process, I was, you know, was already making prints. I took a portfolio actually to the Vermont Wealth Life Center and talked to who was then the, the director of the Vermont Wealth Life Center, Jane Beck, very renowned American um, uh, folk uh, historian, folk, uh, what would I say? What would I call her? She's just she's very well trained in, in the folk arts. She had done a major book on Vermont crafts and Vermont folk artwork um, and proposed it, that, it, that I would try to do some form of book. And, and they were they were very interested in the whole idea. So, and I actually had already generated quite about quite a large amount of um, narrative to accompany it, telling stories and things. And so they put me with another person who ended up being an editor with it. And, um, and we, we were just about a year and a half in advance of the publication of the book. But, but anyway, they were, they were interested. They were, they were going to look for funding to, and so, and doing a large traveling exhibition and, um, also a, a, a book, um, but it, you know, one of your questions has been, you know, how did this all take place? It was, you know, one of the again major factors was sort of returning to Vermont, which always is in the back of my mind. Um, it was also a, about uh, males and maleness and nurturing males and um, initiation, and I was, you know, very interested in sort of reading lots of these, which were considered kind of. Oh, popular book at that point, sort of about men and males and, and uh, relationship between fathers and sons. My father's, again, I mentioned uh, earlier, I guess last week, about sort of an up and down relationship with my father, which was, was tough and challenging. Um, but I think that, that part of the thing that drew me into this project was related to that. It had nothing to do with hunting, which is kind of interesting. I mean, I tell people this, they can't believe it because it's a uh, um, I remember going to a, a book reading by Annie Prue out in uh, Boulder, Colorado, quite a number of years later. She was a friend who she wrote a little blurb about the Deer Camp book. We were really interested in the process, actually. We knew each other. She was then living in Vermont. And I remember a Colorado, and he sounded like he probably lived out in the rain somewhere. He said, I remember him complimenting and say, "You really know how to write cowboy," mm -hmm. and it, you know, it's. Um, I think that was certainly an interesting compliment. I mean, that was before she had written her novella or short story um, that became a film. But but what's interesting though is that um, I think that I was complimented for my ability to sort of, um, in some way generate and or capture the tone of, and the meaning of the hunting to mm -hmm. the hunters in my narrative and my photographs. Uh -huh. I seem to be able to make the kinds of photographs that, but, but, but I'll tell you quickly about the process involved with that is I made about 5,000 photographs over that four and a half year period of actually doing the field work. Uh -huh. um, and they, they were edited to about 60 to 70 images. So that's the editing process that was involved. Uh -huh. And, and the same thing happened with collecting uh, the hunting story. Uh, just reams and reams of transcribed um, text uh, from oral history inter interviews. This is, this is before any kinds of technology and computers could be used for, for that kind of transcription work. And uh, again, about 3% of all the two months of recorded material was used for the narrative in the book. So that, that's where I learned about the, the wonderful process, the interactive collegial relationship that one can have with an editor in both the photographic and uh -huh. the, the verbal, but it was it was a, a major growing project. And one of the reasons I was mentioning, talking with you earlier, Mercy, is that um, with all my work doing, my assignment work, working with all the passion of curators and the very knowledgeable people about whatever the subject might be, they brought a, a uh, not only just that passion, but a very in-depth knowledge and interest in the subjects with whom they work. 
And I think in a way with my earlier work with Shoveling Museum, photographing objects to mm -hmm. uh, working with all these historians. And by the way, I, I bring some of my manuscript and my photographs back and show them to some of the people with whom I worked in Providence. Uh -huh. At Brown University, I remember some of these great historians who specialize in dealing with architecture and painting look at my photographs of Northern Vermont. They gave me very interesting feedback um, about the work. So that was um, all that was very formative in terms of not only that book project, but it it um, gave credence for me to the, this project upon which I was working. But it just it was an enlightening experience um, having that collegial um, criticism, positive criticism, and um, actually editorial reviewing mm -hmm. of my work. And, and, and I guess all that experience was a profound sort of a um, epiphany for me, though, in terms of it brought me deeper into the nature of my work and my commitment to documentary work. So I have continued since that. I mean, that was published in 1992, Deer Camp. And then in a much earlier large series, my first series, which you know we were talked about earlier, making those photographs in Northern Vermont, was not published until 2001. Mm -hmm. um, I think about 30 years, counting the pavement to get that. But but anyway, it all was, it's all made sense in this sort of this trajectory over time is this, um, just gaining more and more knowledge and, and sort of more of sort of intuitive perception in terms of how to uh -huh. approach a subject. So and, the, I think what I, you know, what I want to ask you about, about this also comes from a conversation we had in which you um, talked about in the history of documentary photography, that there um there was early on um a contrast between the life and the privilege of the photographer and the sort of stark circumstances of the subject um, um so you know i think some of the you know, famous documentary photographers um, sort of had this experience, but your experience was quite different in that the subjects of your photography were people you really had developed over your lifetime, as we've talked about during these two interviews, you had developed a very deep relationship with as being part of the same community, even though as an individual, you might have had different life experiences. You shared um, uh, you, you had a you, you had a deep sharing of appreciation for the land, for the culture, for the community and for the people who live there, which you cultivated from childhood on. Um, so I just you know, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that, because I, it really stands in stark contrast to, you know, the work of, um, of other photographers who are well known, who, who did this type of work. Yeah, I, 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 again, I, I would say that the, my subject matter, if it's, if it, particularly if it's architecture or if it's, uh, this is my own personal work, or it might have been landscape, I actually was interested in, in working in, in the subject matter at times that was not just dramatic, spectacular looking things. I mean, Ansel Adams worked the West. He, every, I mean, everything he photographed, his photographs were dramatic, but he photographed dramatic landscape. I photographed what my, many would say would be a more humdrum, uh, nothing particular interesting about it, but I, I I was interested in just, I had a personal connection to many of these places. So they were, they had value to me because they were part mm -hmm. of my, who I am and or was 50 or so years ago. Um, and so I think I have often returned to places of familiarity, right? Um, I would not be doing documentary work on the streets of New York City probably, right? Or places where I felt right. somewhat out of place, to say the least. Not out of fear per se. I mean, I photographed all over the streets and 
parts of Italy and things that were you know, a little sketchy. I mean, uh, but never felt worried about it, but I, I felt that uh, I just tended toward place. And I think the same goes with photographing people and doing portraits. I, I did not ever photograph, I never photographed luminaries who, you know, as soon as you made the photograph, it had immediate financial value, right? Because they were like the Richard Abaddon's and things in New York City or wherever. I, I photographed people who most people didn't know other than if you lived in the mm -hmm. community where the people lived. Um, and so that to me was all I needed. I don't need to look for anything of, of greater value than just dealing with people who were just lived their lives normally or, you know, not even, not even abnormally. Just, uh, I just was interested in the, the photographic process, the aesthetic, right? Just trying to make beautiful photographs of some of the most simple things. And I think but also being interested in the people, interested in the objects, interested in the land or the buildings I was photographing because initially it was just, it was just a sort of an intuitive, natural thing for me to do. And then after all this training, uh, working at Shelburne, that I have been, had the very good fortune of handling beautiful, beautiful objects. Right. And have spent many, many years observing extraordinary things and it was not until maybe traveling to Italy and places in Europe and spending time with you know architectural ar I mean artists and architectural historians from RISD I spent three weeks traveling around Italy just listening to three other fellows talk about um, what we were looking at I mean they knew the history mm -hmm. I did not but I mean just listening to them talk about the subtleties of buildings and and land use all these things and it was I mean all those kind of things have brought a greater depth to my appreciation of whatever I photograph. I, um, and so travel has been a, a important part of what I have found, I think, important to my um, growing as a photographer. Mm -hmm. um, and also going into areas where it's less comfortable. But again, it's, I, I'm, not, I'm not out to I'm not out to save the world. I mean, the earlier photography, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, some of the photograph photographers working in Europe, I mean, they, they photographed the squalor of working conditions and things. Late 19th century, early 20th century, photographers like Jacob Rees in New York, Lewis Hine. Lewis Hine's work was very was pivotal for developing child labor laws. I mean, they really did extraordinary mm -hmm. work, beautiful, beautiful photographs. and. They also did them for you know, what they would have said political reasons, but they they were interested in improving the quality of people's lives. Whereas that has not been a, a, the motive for what I do. I I, I do try to acknowledge mm -hmm. that to me that this the what's you know legitimate in terms of there's no, there's no ulterior motive I guess to what I do. Right. Just, well, now I so the way I've I started to think about it as I was listening to you was that. Um, there also is that I guess in foot in th there was a certain um, value or aesthetic about objectivity, the objectivity of the lens of the camera, which obviously could lend itself to a kind of a social justice agenda, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what you had is people who were coming from very privileged backgrounds, but because of that contrast between their background and the background of their subjects, they could pretend, you know, the idea was that they could bring some objectivity to the viewer about the circumstances that most of their peers, social peers would never see. On the other hand, your experience, which is one, as you say, without an agenda, and is really more as a compatriot of your subjects, not a, uh, an external observer, not a foreign or strange observer, I would say you're sort of in a way bringing more heart than objectivity. The lens has got its own objective nature to it. Um, obviously, as an art, you know, artist and technician, you can you play with that, right? But, and that's been another deep interest of yours in terms of perspective. But uh, I think what was has always been so impressive to me has been 
the kind of heartfelt um, a commitment um, and interest in the in in your you know this these communities in this northeast kingdom which you and i both grew up in but which is fundamentally a rural and a um and a, i don't know if i want to call it poor but it is not um the, the val primary value in that part of the world is not physical or monetary success there's not a show there's not a value it's you know it's really all about the community and the land and the people and their relationships and i think that has really been reflected in your work and i think it's reflected in the way you talk about it you know it's i, I think that people say well why on earth do I, do I not have a website with all this work these large bodies of work but i you know it's, some of that work would be fine on a website but also i've always sort of felt uncomfortable about um i mean people when i was you know doing these projects really in, in private places private spaces in people's homes and things mm -hmm. i never really felt comfortable about putting that them out on parade like that i mean i have in many cases not at all have all the signed releases and everything i mean i could do all kinds of things with photographs but but i and, and there and many photographers have exploited uh -huh. the intentions might have been somewhat good but they have exploited people and and, and i i just would rather i just when I, if i have like have my book come out in exhibitions where they're just they're just not out the people who come to the exhibits are people who are truly interested in the work um and or in publication form where they put in a context of i have more control over how they're presented when you put things out willy-nilly on the internet um there's not enough often enough information uh -huh. to understand why right. the photographs are there and so you know i i am I mean, not at all interested in any way compromising uh, people okay. and, and so that's that has kept me sort of at uh, somewhat uh maybe the fame is not coming my way right. really, but but which, which is just well, fine because i've, I've learned these people are giving sorry. to me by allowing me to photograph i'm trying to give back to them i bring them back prints so thank them but John, i do use, use, we use, need use to some stop. of that word we need to stop our time is okay up. and here All we right. go well, john's gonna <laughs> this i think what you just were saying is to me an exemplification of what i'm saying you're you know very careful attention to the lives of your subjects and your and your true motivation thank you so much for joining us uh, john you. miller documentary photographer from the Northeast Kingdom in Vermont has been talking to us about his passion and his career as a photographer and for his, you know, subjects and his subject matter. Thank you, John, um, for joining you, me Mercy. today. Yes. And this is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show.